Hello, everybody out there in Facebook land and YouTube live and wherever else you all are. Uh, we are excited about the Arulis Cafe today. Uh, we have some magnificent guests on today, and we're going to talk about a topic that's kind of an unusual topic for us to talk about. It's going to be about immigration, but it's not going to be about immigration in the way that we've been talking about it over the last four years. You know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, Trish Zita, who I work with and work for, she um, was telling me that her mother was so excited election night when, well, it wasn't really election night because they didn't get a chance to make the uh, speech until well after election night. But when President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect uh, um, Kamala Harris, when they made their speeches, she said that her mother was so excited she had to call Italy. And I was wondering why would she call Italy? And Trish reminded me that she is the child of an immigrant. Hence, I began to think about the whole issue of immigrations, uh, immigration and, and immigrants and why people come to this country. And I thought about some of the people I know, some of the people I have read about, and some of the people I work with, and remembering their stories that their parents actually came from other countries and they are first generation Americans. So we are going to present them to you tonight, first generation Americans. And some of you who are watching, you already know many of them and you'll get to know the other, but we're gonna talk about their countries. We're gonna talk about their food, talk about their culture, their religion, their, their entertainment. We wanna hear about it all. And we want to hear their stories. First, let's bring on Trish. How are you doing, Trish? Great, Janine. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thanks for joining us uh, here today. This is so exciting to think you actually are the trigger point for this conversation today. Right. Who knew? But thank you. This is going to be a great conversation, and I'm so excited to be part of it. Well, I have to tell you, after you had that conversation with me, now I'm looking at you as the child of an immigrant. It's funny, I never looked at you. You are, of course, American, but looking at you as a child of an immigrant, and I'm excited by hearing about where your parents came from, why they're here. We're gonna bring you back in, but thank you so very, very much. Happy to be here, thank you. The next person is a physician. She owns her own urgent care center in New York but New York doesn't get all the credit for her because she's a New Jersey, she's a Jersey girl. She used to be a New Yorker, but we have claimed her Dr. Tamara <laughs> Moise. How are you doing, Doc? I'm doing wonderful. How are you today? A wonderful, wonderful. And so you are our Haitian connection. Your parents came from Haiti. Yes. Very good. Well, we, we we're going to want to hear about that. And I would imagine that you'll also have some stories to talk about with the uh, earthquake there. Being a doctor, I can't imagine you weren't there to kind of help out along the way. So we're going to bring you back in to hear those stories as well. I'll be here. All right. Thank you. All right. We had to have a politician in the bunch. You know, you can't have have a show unless you have a politician. And so we have one of the best. We have uh, Mayor Gabriel, we call him Gabe Rodriguez, the mayor of West New York. Come on in, how are you doing, Mayor? I think you might still be muted. Are you muted? Can you hear me now? Oh, absolutely. Oh, you're the first I'm time we got a politician that we couldn't hear, I love that. Oh boy, oh boy. No, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be on this, it's great to end the day on a very positive note and a very positive conversation, which is what this is, I'm sure it's gonna be. So thank you for having me. And I would imagine with this whole pandemic, you have your hands full right now. Yes, yes, uh, I was elected last year. And so it's been a very, very interesting uh, year and almost uh, and a half of my first year and a half as mayor, but um, to serve your community is a blessing. So we're happy here. And, and your parents came from Cuba. Both of them came from Cuba, that's Both correct. Both of them came from Cuba. So I'm sure you're going to have some real stories to tell. Sure. Look forward to it. Thank you Absolutely. so much. I look forward to it, thank you. 
So Sabine, <laughs> Sabine, we see. Uh, yes. Thank you so much for coming on. And uh, Sabine, um, I've had some fascinating conversations with you. I can't wait until you share some of those stories uh, with the uh, viewers tonight. But I, uh, one of the things that I think is amazing when I ask you about uh, the religion, I said, well, you know, your uh, dad was from, and, and again, our condolences on the passing of your father. Um, but your dad was from India, your mom from Pakistan. I'm like, okay, how were you raised? Were you Muslim? Were you Hindu? And you're like, Christianity. I'm like, Christianity. So we're going to have a real conversation about that. Uh, but thank okay. you for coming on the show tonight. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to a really great conversation with people that I respect, and I can't wait to hear the backstory behind them. So thank you. Absolutely, and thank you. So that is, these are our guests tonight, and they are all going to tell their story. And um, one of the things um, I, I like to start off with, why your parents came to America. You know, I can't talk about um, my background, why my parents came to America, because uh, it's not something that was a happy hour for us why African um, Americans came to this country, but we're here. And I think one of the things that's so exciting is that when you think about immigration and you think about America, we are a country of immigrants. We're just, you know, nobody really came from America. And so that's why your story that you will remind us of tonight is so amazing to tell. And um, Trish, we're gonna start with, we're gonna start with Italy. We want to okay. know exactly why your parents came. Did both of them come here? Did they meet here and get married? Tell us the story. So it's really, it's an interesting story, I have to say. So both my parents are from Italy, a small town in the central region, Campania region. And my mother, so both my parents came to the United States eventually because of World War II. Um, you know, after World War II, they were toddlers, there was really no commerce, no ability for their families to, you know, move forward or really take care of them. And so my mother was the oldest of four daughters, um, still is, luckily, she's, uh, all her three siblings are alive. And she came to the United States and she was, she turned 18, literally 18 years old on the boat on the way here to the United States and settled in the Bronx, New York, and lived with her aunt and uncle. My father, he went kind of a different route. He left Italy and then went to Australia. And he lived in Australia for about six years. And, uh, you know, he worked there on tobacco farms and pretty much just getting work anywhere he could. And both of them did the same thing. They worked and sent some money home to their families. Um, Eventually, it's kind of funny, they were back in the in Italy where they met up again and they kind of fell back in love. They were really good friends growing up, um, decided to get married. They eventually got married in Italy, but my father couldn't get a visa to the United States for two years. So he was married to my mom. Um, she was living in New York City and he was in Italy waiting to get a visa and then eventually came over and uh, that's how they both ended up in the United States. But it was really because of the hardship of World War II and the belief that coming to the US would give them a better life and you know just prosperity and, and ability to work. Tell me about the language in your home because I, I was curious yeah. when you told me, well, Janine, my parents barely speak English. Yeah. So they both speak some English, but not, um, I mean, look, you would be able to have a full conversation with them, but their accents are still very, um, very heavy Italian accents. And it's, I think because when they, and I think this is the case with a lot of um, immigrants, they moved to an area of New York where there were other Italian immigrants and they set up, you know, kind of their own little town there where they spoke Italian to each other and there were Italian stores and they, you know, hung out together. And then when they moved to New Jersey, it was the same. My grandparents lived in Trenton for a while 
And, you know, the Chambersburg area of Trenton there, a lot of Italian immigrants there from all over Italy, um, but they tend to congregate together. And then my parents, when they got married and, and eventually moved to New Jersey themselves from New York, bought property in Hamilton, which was nothing but farmland back then, and built a home there, um, but spoke Italian primarily to us growing up. And I tell this funny story sometimes that, you know, I learned Sesame Street English because in my house, everyone spoke Italian to each other until, you know, I started watching television and, and it was time to go to kindergarten. And we realized, and my parents realized like, she needs to speak English as well as she speaks Italian. Wow. And so I started to, you know, watch Sesame Street and learn English. And of course, you know, we had neighbors and friends as well. But yeah, it was, um, I was very bilingual until I got into grammar school. So you're fluent right now. You are actually fluent in Italian and English. Si, parlo italiano. Okay, well, I know what I'm going to get you to teach me one day. I didn't know that. See, the cat's out of that bag. We've got to talk about that in the office. Happy, happy to do it. <laughs> so now we're going to bring... Um, we're going to bring our Haitian on. And that's the other thing I, I didn't ask Trish, but I'm going to ask her when I bring her back on. Um, because do you consider yourself, what do you say? Are you Haitian? Are you Haitian American? Tell me what you call yourself, Doc. I call myself Haitian American. And then when I get, uh, when I get flack from Haitians <laughs> that are great from <laughs> Haiti, I tell uh -huh. them that you can call me Yankee and American all you want, but Haitian blood runs through my veins. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Why did your parents come to America? Tell me about that. So uh, both my parents came in the late 60s, early 70s, and they were fleeing a dictatorship. At the time, uh, Jacques-Claude Duvalier was uh, the, 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 the son of the original dictator. Uh, was in power and he functioned as a dictator himself. Um, so it was a tough time in Haiti. And, you know, the older I get and the more um, time that I've been able to spend in Haiti, I've been able to speak to people that um, actually suffered under his re regime. So luckily my parents, you know, they didn't necessarily, um, they had some bad experiences under his, uh, under his rule, but uh, there were some other people that, you know, had people killed of them had their fathers like i knew someone that their father was killed you know point blank in front of in front of her and you know so um it was a really tough time you know so they uh so they left for that reason and uh they wind up settling in new jersey actually um they started out in jersey city which is where i live <laughs> and everything came back full circle so they um they had met in Haiti and then uh, came to Jersey because my mother's sister used to live in Jersey City and they got married um, here in Jersey City as well and then eventually moved to Queens, New York and had me in 1976. So what was it, were, were they professionals? What, what did they do uh, for vocation? Uh, so when they came from Haiti, um, they did not have professions in their hands. My father, who's deceased, um, he died uh, about uh, eight years ago. When he came, he was lucky enough to find a job as a cytotechnologist. Um, he got this job from his brother-in-law. And this is a profession uh, where you're basically the assistant to a pathologist. And nowadays, you actually need to uh, have four years of college and I believe master's training in order to uh, have that profession. But at the time that wasn't required in the seventies and he just learned it through like an, as an apprenticeship. Uh, so he was able to work at uh, what's now LabCorp for almost 25 years. Oh, yeah. So, okay. and then um, my my mother had, so both my parents had the, by the time they came here, they had, they had the equivalent of an associate's degree. Um, mm -hmm. So with that, my mother basically did uh, many different types of like cl clerical and administrative jobs um, throughout the years. And she's now retired living in Long Island. Tell me about your language. What language did you grow up with? So, you know, interestingly enough, uh, English was not my first language either. <laughs> and I went to kindergarten speaking straight up French. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so uh, long story short, um, my parents actually spoke, uh, they wanted me to learn French as my first language, as opposed to Haitian Creole. Haitian Creole is comprised of French, but also many, uh, a mix of many different African languages. So um, Creole is considered to be, I guess, the, um, the not as fancy language, um, you know, which I don't agree with because it's, it is it, actually now it's considered a language and now considered the first language of Haiti as opposed to French. However, they wanted me to be, uh, to have French in my, uh, you know, in my repertoire. So that was the first um, uh, language that they taught me. But the thing is my parents are so used to Creole that they would slip back into Creole all, all the time. So I did learn French, but at the end of the day, I went to school you know, I kind of lost the French and then was gaining Creole. But I did take French throughout uh, in high school and college. And I have family in France, very close family. So um, there is that French is still there, but it's really rusty. My Creole is a lot better just because of my profession. I bump into a lot of Haitians and most of them speak Haitian mm. Creole, more so than French. Right. And what what is your religion? Um, we actually grew up Catholic and um, okay. Catholicism, you know, Haiti has a very interesting, uh, it's very interesting when you look at it from the religious perspective. Um, so uh, Catholic, we're mostly Catholics there, um, which makes us unique in uh, among the Caribbean. Uh, however, um, you know, there are still quite a few Protestant um, re religions that are practiced in Haiti. And then we also have voodoo, which is based on, um, old time African religions. And the interesting thing about Haitians is that they tend to mesh the two. So there are people that are Catholic, but still do that <laughs> may do may practice some voodoo practices. <laughs> see, so, uh, see, it's I very thought interesting. Was, I thought that yeah. was a stereotypical thing. Uh, oh, no. I didn't know. So it's really yeah. true. The little dolls and all that really true. Well, listen, um, voodoo, you know, in all seriousness, it gets a bad rap. It is a religion. It's to be respected okay. just like any other re religion. This is not a religion that is, uh, uh, that is meant to, um, uh, to be a negative thing. This is not what it is. And the, and the only reason that voodoo gets a bad rap is because it's based on an African religion. That's the only reason if it was wow. based, That's if it was, you know, okay. Cause if this was Christianity, these you know, uh, these misconceptions would never be made, but because it's an African religion and when uh, Christopher C Columbus and his little cronies came onto the island of Hispaniola, they mm. shut out and tried to get rid of voodoo, but voodoo is actually the part of the reason why we were able to be the first independent black nation on in the Western hemisphere. Right. Right. It has a lot to do uh, with that in with our revolution with the haitian revolution of uh, of 1804. well i can see what i'm going to be researching in the future i need to know more because you know i'm all about religions and i need to know more about voodoo you know trish i brought you on because i wanted to ask you about uh, your uh religion as well you were raised what catholic straight up catholic oh, i'm so shocked i'm so catholic, shocked catholic grammar school catholic high school my parents you know me too. <laughs> yeah, you graduated from McCorston, right? Yes, McCorston High School right here in Hamilton. Okay, okay, great. Well, I, I have some more questions I wanna ask the two of you, but I'm gonna bring the mayor on first. And uh, there are a couple things I would like to ask him as well. So, Mayor, tell me about Cuba. Well, uh, both my parents came from Cuba. Uh, they did not come together. My parents met here. Uh, in New Jersey, actually, in my hometown, I'm, if I'm, uh, I'm almost certain, West New York. Uh, but they both came from Cuba, different times in their lives. My father came when he was six years old, and my mother came when she was 16. Uh, but both, uh, both my, both sets of grandparents, or or my grandmother and my grandparents, um, came here uh, for the same reason that most immigrants come. And that's for in search of a better life. Uh, you know, better education, access to access to education and 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 what have you. So, you know, we education has always been a huge factor uh, in our lives as a family. My grandmother was a teacher in Cuba. Uh, and then that that transferred down to my my father, who became uh, an educator. He was a, a school teacher uh, and retired two years ago as a, as a principal. 
and my mother also became an educator. So, uh, you know, education was was uh, an access to education was was a, was a huge driving force uh, for my grandparents, both sides to come to the United States and obviously uh, the overall, you know, American dream in search of a better life. So, um, you know, and and the political landscape in Cuba obviously was a huge factor. It was, uh, it was the rise of the Fidel Castro revolution around that time in the later 50s, which is when my father came at six. Uh, and then for my mom, who came in the early 70s, for her, it was kind of uh, we need to get out of here. Uh, things are getting bad and and, and worse. And so, um, you know, here we are, uh, you know, years and years later, trying to to uh, bring that American dream to light for all of those people who sacrificed so much for uh, for us to be here. You know, when you think about their fleeing Cuba because of the politics, the political landscape and their son grows up to be the mayor. Of a, of a city in New Jersey. Uh, that's pretty awesome, right? Yeah, no pressure, right? No pressure? No uh, pressure. But um, that is, uh, especially when you are able to serve in the community that you were born and raised, and for yeah. them in the community that they raised their, their children to see, uh, and especially, again, that emphasis on education, which is public service, uh, this emphasis on giving back to your community, uh, raising your community, educating community um, was very, very big in my household. Uh, not only for my parents, but like I said, for my grandparents, my grandmother on my mother's side was a nurse. So public service was something that we, we uh, is in our, was in our, our, our DNA as a family. And so it's translated into, into me serving in, in, as a, an elected official. Um, but uh, you, you, you carry that, I think when you're, when you're the son of an immigrant, you carry this, um, I don't know if the word is this pressure, this added, this added pressure, because you're, you're here because of other people's sacrifices. People sacrificed their careers. Uh, they sacrificed being around their, their loved ones, family. Um, sometimes they sacrifice their lives to, to come here in the name of improving uh, and evolving their family. So that's something that I think anybody who is the son of immigrants uh, knows very well about uh, this this idea of you know you're we're here because of you, uh, mm -hmm. and 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 we're here for you to to better yourself. So don't let anybody down. Uh, it's it's very much a factor when wow. you're first generation born in America, especially uh, mm -hmm. obviously sons of immigrants. And we're going to talk about um, a little later the differences of which. Uh, type of immigrant you are and how um, does that influence uh, what kind of American you are. Sure. But um, it, it's fascinating. You know, I, I think about when you said uh, many of them sacrifice even being with their families. You know, we take it for granted when we're, uh, what, those of us who are not immigrants just born here, all of our yeah. family, everybody's here. And we get really right. uptight when people begin to move to another state. But here you have relatives in other countries and they did flee. Uh, they did give up a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when in, in a country like Cuba, uh, where many of the time, many for many people, their experience was once they left, they knew they were not going to be able to come back uh, mm -hmm. uh, because of, of, of the political landscape, whether and whether they played a part in in politics on the island during the revolution, after the revolution, um, this was always a factor in, in, in determining who you were on the island and in Cuba at the time, uh, because those people were persona non grata to, to the Castro regime. And then obviously uh, your entire experience coming here, you know, my grandmother never saw her mother again. Uh, uh, you know, my grandmother saw her one time when she returned. Uh, and so that, that, that sends, that sets a completely different tone and an outlook on your life yeah. uh, because you kind of, I mean, you, they all wanted to come here, but it's very different when you're like, I don't think I'm going to see my mom ever again. Clearly that, that is a huge factor. And then to come to a country. So you never met your grandmother. No, no, they, I never met my great grandmothers, but my great -grandmother, grandmother knew when she left Cuba, she oh, would never okay. see her mother again. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so to know that you're coming to a new country you don't know the language, you don't know anything, not to have your immediate family support. Uh, for some people, for many immigrants, is a, is a huge uh, 
obstacle in trying to establish yourself in a in a brand new country. Right, right. We're going to bring Sabine in a very similar uh, conversation. And Sabine, uh, I really would like to know, you know, why your why your parents came here, and uh, you told me some interesting information about you're not being able to go back. And um, I, I want to talk with all of the guests um, about going back and have you been back to your parents' native land. But I think your story is um, it's really just intriguing. Why did they come here? Yeah, thank you, Janine. So my dad um, was from uh, Delhi in India, and my mom was from Lahore in Pakistan. And they didn't know each other back when they were um, in their home countries. Um, but it was you know, really following the partition of India that divided the country so much um, based on their religion. And that was only increased um, when um, Christians were really just persecuted um, in both India and Pakistan, but especially in Pakistan. And even if you had wealth or status, um, as soon as um, there was weakness or the figurehead or the male head of your family passed away, um, they basically had to just survive and get out. Um, it was, especially for my mother's side, it was really a matter of life and death. So um, over the course of a few years, my mom's family traveled to um, America and how it works for, I'm sure, most other immigrant families and other similar stories. Once one person kind of sets up shop, everyone else follows suit because they, they know what's familiar in another country. So they ended up settling in Denver, Colorado. And similarly to my father in 1976, uh, my father was a physician, so he had more options, but not a lot of opportunity. Um, he wanted to really um, serve a lot of different types of people, and he wouldn't have really been able to do so in India, especially with all of just the um, uh, hostility between the different religions. So also in 1976, but separately, my dad came to Denver, Colorado also, and um, they, my parents actually ended up meeting at a, um, a class studying for boards. Uh, my father, like I said, was a physician and my mother's mom was a physician. And so they had to redo their schooling and their testing to get recertified here, even though they had practices open in the other countries. And they became family friends because of that, um, really because especially Denver, 1976, not a lot of people looked like them. So to them, they didn't really see Pakistan or India. They were just really saw each other as mutual Christians, just trying to make it a new country. Um, when my parents then got married, they ended up moving to New York for my dad's residency, and then they kind of just set up shop there and were there for, uh, I guess, the last 40, 40 or so years. Um, and now I'm just the outlier in uh, New Jersey. Um, it's interesting, though, being half Indian, half Pakistani, and Christian, because I'm technically not really supposed to exist, and neither is my sister. Um, and really, my parents didn't even see their relationship as mixed until I was growing older. I grew up in a really white area, so I was just like, I'm South Asian, I'm Indian, I'm proud. And then when I got to college and met other Indians, I realized, oh, I'm, I'm not that kind of an Indian. And I kind of realized I'm in this other category. And um, I grew to really love and appreciate my culture from this newfound kind of um, outlook at where I came from and how different it was. And we, I really, I grew up lucky and being able to travel a lot, but India and Pakistan are the two countries that I have not been able to travel to. Um, for Pakistan, it was um, unsafe, especially as a Christian, but um, in India, we're more liberal and more possible. Frankly, I thought that would be kind of my shoe in to my heritage, but not so much because every time I've applied for a visa or something like that, it gets lost or denied. Um, but really, it's because I'm half Pakistani and Christian, so that just proves to be a, a barrier. But I did joke with Janine that now that I'm married to a nice, lovely white man, I probably am more likely to be allowed admittance to my home countries. <laughs> so that's why when people ask me where I'm from, I first say New York, and then they say, no, no, really. I'm like, Westchester, New York. But then when we get further in the conversation, it's <laughs> India and Pakistan. And you've touched on something that I really would like to, I mean, just fascinating to, to listen to why you all came here or why your, your parents came here and how you fare. Now, I'm going to ask the question, um, 
you know, when, when I was in elementary school, we had to uh, sing the song, what is America to me, you know? So I always loved that song because I never thought about being anything but American. But now that I look at the four of you, tell me, Doc, what is American? What does it mean to you being American? That's a big question. <laughs> That's a big, big question. That's you a know? Big question. I think that, um, I think it's a privilege to be American. Um, you know, America is not perfect. Absolutely. Uh, we have our issues. However, um, I think it's a privilege. And when you're the child of an immigrant and you listen to the stories of your parents and your family coming from a country where there may have been political strife, um, and, you know, and also too, you know, Haiti, uh, unfortunately, uh, because finances have always been a problem there, um, we're behind in health and education. So um, America has all these things. So, you know, my, my, my parents and my family, uh, you know, they always were uh, always praised uh, America for having all of these opportunities. And, and I think it is a, a great land of opportunity. You know, we still, even though we've been through some tough times politically in the last four years, especially, um, in my opinion. Uh, you know, even despite that, we still, there are still so many advantages of being here in the United States of America compared to being in any other country. So, um, so uh, America to me, it, because I grew up with Haitians who always saw this land as a, uh, you know, as the land of opportunity. So that's, you know, that's how I see it as well, because that's, you know, that's how I was raised. Now, I was always taught that I am blessed to have the opportunities that are here because I wouldn't have had those opportunities if I was in Haiti. And that since these opportunities exist, that I must do everything in my power to take them to the fullest and go as far as I can in life as I can. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, you know, when I, when I look at this tapestry in front of me, um, children of immigrants, um, there's only one person here that if she wanted to, she wouldn't even have to mention that she's a child of an immigrant. She wouldn't even have to be a child of an immigrant. She could just be Caucasian or just white. And I know, Trish, I, I, because you and I have so many deep conversations and I know how you feel about mankind and um, our firm is the lead firm on getting uh, the driver's license for um, undocumented uh, immigrants. We fought really hard for that and were successful. How do you view the whole issue of immigration and being the daughter of immigrants and, and knowing some of the, um, just some of the pain that's here in our country? Yeah, it's, um, so it's interesting because you're right, a lot of people may not look at me and instantly think, oh, you know, she's the daughter of immigrants, but I've always carried that with me. And I think maybe what Gabe said earlier, Mayor Rodriguez, is, is true. Like you, I think as the child of immigrants, you, there's a bar set for you because people made sacrifice to come here and you're expected to live up to your best potential. Um, but I'll tell you, it's an interesting, you know, perspective as well. My parents, as I said, my father had to wait two years to get a visa to get here to the United States, beside the fact that my mother was already um, a naturalized citizen at that point. And so for them, they went through, I guess, the more traditional process of becoming U.S. citizens. Um, but that's not to say it wasn't really hard for them to get here and, and they struggled um, to save money and be able to, you know, find a, a way to build a life here. But it's interesting because from their perspective, you know, I was raised with the understanding that all cultures and all people had the opportunity to come to the United States, all immigrants, and we all had an opportunity to succeed. And that's the lens I look at it through because, I, I mean, I think, you know, Tamara said it as well. We really were, were a land of opportunity. And that's what we offer immigrants when they come here. And so it hurts me sometimes when I hear discussions 
you know, political discussions, and I know we are not going to get into that, but that, you know, portray immigrants as being, you know, lazy or taking jobs or all these negative um, connotations that I just have never experienced, or I don't think to be the case and to be true. I think we're all, you know, immigrants are here because we're seeking a better life. They're looking for opportunity and they're ready to make sacrifice and work hard for it. So uh, that's where I, you know, my lens of, of immigration in this country, it should be, you know, open. And, um, you know, it's not to say that people shouldn't follow rules and do it appropriately and everything else. But, you know, that's what America is about, right? Giving people the opportunity to be better and do, and do well and, and bring your, your family here to do well and raise a family here. And, and we're, we're all products of that. We're, we're perfect right. examples of it. I, I want to know, um, well, Sabine, I want you to tell me what does it mean to you to be an American? And then we're going to go to the mayor. And then we're going to talk about the food. I want to know about <laughs> your food. <laughs> well, I completely echo Trisha's sentiments and really what every member of the panel has been talking about of this idea of hope and dreams and opportunity. And I see America frankly, the same way that my parents did, uh, a lot of potential. There's room for growth. There's a lot of errors that's been had, but our families believed that there would be more opportunity and just ability to grow here. And they had so much faith in the future generations. You know, um, something that I think is always instilled in an immigrant family is not just what you're working for in the today and tomorrow, but what are you really working towards for your future and your family's future. And I just see each further generation taking their place now in their new country, carrying the pride, carrying the heritage, the culture from before and incorporating that into something beautiful and lovely and woven into kind of the, the fabric of what our country's built on. And I think that my responsibility as a first American generation immigrant is to maintain that mindset and to move forward with their hopes and dreams lifting me up, not a burden that I shoulder, but propelling me forward. Mayor? Well, I mean, um, it's a broad, broad question, but it's an excellent question. Uh, I think we're constantly defining and redefining what it is to be an American. Uh, not only in our own personal lives, but in the eyes of other people who don't consider people who necessarily may look like us to be American. And I think that that's a constant challenge. And the way that you break that down is by, is by succeeding and being a successful son of an immigrant or an immigrant. And I think that that's, that is a motivator for immigrants uh, because you come here with, let's face it, with fear fear of failure, fear of, of everything, uh, because you're coming into a new intimidating country. Uh, but I think that um, when you have this motivation to improve your life and your family's life, I think that uh, overpowers that fear. And when you come here, uh, you pour all of this energy into improving your family, yourself, uh, you you forget all of those things. And I think that's very much an American trait. Uh, this um, do or die, uh, you know, uh, success by any means necessary. It, while that's very much an American thing, it's really an immigrant um, outlook on life. And so uh, it, some people may say uh, that the definition of, a, of an American is changing. I think it's always been the same. I think it, it's, it's about progress and success and happiness. I mean, that's in the Constitution, and, and that's exactly what immigrants come here for, right? Uh, the pursuit of happiness. Uh, and, and so when we ask these questions, what does it mean to be an American? What is an American to you? Uh, those are our absolute factors in redefining, I mean, it's always been the definition, but redefining what America is so that other Americans, when they see immigrants or sons of immigrants or grandsons and daughters of immigrants, 
they don't no longer uh, question their presence and their belonging to this country. Uh, and I think that that's, that's something that we all um, carry and we all, in our own ways, individually, improve that narrative so that people see people of color and, 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 and immigrants in a different light, hence redefining their view of what an American is. Thank you very much. I'm going to say a name for you all. Fabiana Pierre Luis. What does that mean to any of the four of you? She is our newest Supreme yes. Court Justice <laughs> in New Jersey. Property of Haiti. <laughs> A property of Haiti. There you Ça go. Passe, right? Ça passe. Order of yes, and I tell you, and 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 made history the first black woman ever appointed to the New Jersey Supreme Court and only one of three uh, blacks put on the Supreme Court. So you know where we're headed next. We're gonna talk about Kamala Harris or Kamala, Kamala Harris. Tell me what did it mean to each of you, children of immigrants, to think that a daughter of two immigrants would end up being the vice president elect of this country. Sabine, what did it mean to you? Well, first of all, I was so thrilled that she was half black and half South Asian. It just, that mix alone meant so much to me right. because it was just so indicative of the fabric of our country and where we come from. And with the Black Lives Matter movement, we've seen just such a, um, at first, such a um, divisive kind of reaction to it. You know, you were either black or an other. And people really didn't understand the tenor of the movement is talking about really just at the basis we're different, but we're not. And Kamala encompassing both of these cultures and colors and being a woman to me was just so indicative of where the direction of our country, I hope, is going towards. So it was just, it was beautiful. And I remember when Kamala first was just on the scene in general, my mom called me just so excited. Oh, do you know where her mom's from? Oh, do you know where her dad's from? And it was just so much pride for both sides. And I have to say, it's just, it, it warms my heart, my, my politically jaded heart. <laughs> right? <laughs> I have to say, I'm excited for what it means and where we're gonna go from here. Right, Trish? I know what it means to you. Tell me about uh, it. <laughs> you know, I've been a big fan of Kamala Harris for quite a while. And um, so I was so excited when Joe Biden picked her as his VP nominee. And I, I've shared this with Janine. I, I, you know, I feel this connection to her because she is the daughter of immigrants. That was the first thing I was like, wow, she's a woman, daughter of immigrant parents. Um, you know, I just... I, I definitely felt a connection with her and so proud. I was just so proud of her. She's smart. Um, and Janine started this segment, but you know, my, my mom called me uh, to tell me that she, this was after the, you know, the election was called and, you know, she was so excited. She's my mother's 83 years old. And she said, I never thought in my lifetime I would see a woman and a woman of immigrant children be the vice president in, in this that is country. So cool. she, I just love she, that. The way she, she said it. You know? She was <laughs> giddy. She was giddy on the phone. And she had just hung up talking to her sister in Italy, who called and was so like congratulating my mom, as if my mom wow. had something to do with the election, but like congratulating the United States that we had, you know. Vice Pre or President elect Biden and, and Vice President elect Kamala Harris, but particularly to talk about Kamala Harris. And so, yeah, I, um, I, I not, look, and I just think that having a woman be in a role of authority like that will bring some balance and some, some thoughtfulness and hopefully, and you know, calmer, just lower the temperature a little bit and lower. It. Um, yeah, just really excited for her. And, and to think that the daughter of immigrants is going to be the last person in the room with this president when he makes a decision. That's yep. the thing I love about it. And uh, so, so Doc, 
What did it mean to you when you saw that a daughter of an immigrant was going to be our vice president and a woman? I teared. I got emotional. <laughs> I got, I, 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 I'm even a little emotional now. <laughs> like, so am they, I. I mean, me too. It, I have tears on the sides of both of my eyes. It, 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 I mean, you know, as I know, you know, we, we don't need to get too political. We can if we want, but <laughs> it's been a tough four years because I, I feel like we've been under the leadership of someone who would never accept, uh, you know, I mean, we, I feel like we're on like the completely wrong path. So it's like to be on the wrong path and then to end up with this, it's like, it's a complete 180 and it happened so quickly. Yes. And um, I'm extremely proud, you know, so a, a couple of things. So she's half Jamaican. So we, we must put that out there. Yes. <laughs> I'm married to a Jamaican. So Jamaicans <laughs> are my family as well. So Jamaicans are extremely proud. And something that really touched me, I think I was watching BBC. I love to stay, you know, current on world affairs. And the town that Kamala's mother is from have been praying for her to win the election. So they, so wow. prior to even the results being shown, they actually um, showed uh, different prayer groups of folks in the town in India where Kamala's uh, family is from, that they were praying for her to win. And they're, they're actually billboards of her in, in, in her mm -hmm. hometown. So I, you know, it's so just all of that Beautiful. just embodies, I, I, I think her being in office embodies what America actually is. She mm -hmm. is what America is. We are, mm -hmm. you know, we, tr you know, Truly, uh, America is a is you know ha was founded on the principle of accepting folks from different backgrounds. So, in fact, I feel like a woman should have been vice president or president a long time ago. I actually think it's a bit yeah. shameful that it happened this late, but I am yeah. I am thankful that, that that it did happen. So I am ecstatic that she is a woman vice president. I'm ecstatic that she chose Karine Jean Pierre who's Haitian to be in the middle exactly well. right. So I am extremely right. thrilled about that. And, you and know. I'm, and I'm thrilled because she is gay. Kareem yes. is, is gay. Um, I mean, it's that, like the whole thing. She got all the my kisses. <laughs> and she, and look, and she married a white guy. I mean, when you look at this. A Jewish man. Really, she married a Jewish right? man. I mean, but this is what America is. And I refuse. Is this who we are? I refuse to let the folks in America who think of America as otherwise. I refuse to let them infiltrate their closed ideas and their racism and their d discrimination. Don't make me start shouting I, here today. Could you I'm not, not get I will to, not. <laughs> <laughs> I refuse to let, right. and you know, and then with the American flag, I was almost, you know, in the last four years, I'm, I'm, I'm a big traveler and I was almost uh, ashamed to say that I was American, you know, but, at the end of the day, I was like, wait a minute, this, I'm from, I was born in Queens. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, I should be carrying an American flag and proud. And, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm not going to let you know, other groups of people within America who don't really appreciate what America is founded on, you know, take a flag away from me. I'm not doing that. So I do carry my flag around and I'm still proud. I'm proud of my Haitian flag I and my it. American flag. So that's I what Kamala means to me. <laughs> Beautiful. Mayor? Well, I mean, uh, to kind of piggyback on what the doctor said, you know, symbols, the American flag are are important uh, and, and images are important. And so for me, you know, and obviously, you know, the fact that she's the son of immigrants is huge. But for me, the fact that she was a woman of color occupying now to occupy the vice president's seat uh, I have a five-year-old daughter. So for me, it is huge for her to see these images of women in mm -hmm. leadership, you know, high leadership, because images are extremely impactful, especially when you are the son of an immigrant or a person of color. And so to see a person that 
resembles you in some way, mm -hmm. shape or form, beginning with the fact that she's a woman for my daughter is extremely important because I need to, to, her to always know that she's the same as everybody else. Yeah. And, so and that she could be somebody whatever has, she wants to be. Whatever she wants to be. And I think that the narrative, that narrative was a little bit hazy in the last four years. Yeah. Be if, if you were a woman, be if you were a person of color, be if you were an immigrant. And so now to see her there and to be able to tell her, like I have told her, she's going to be our vice president, that lady right there, because she's a woman that looks like some people in my family. That is extremely important to me because it's important for her growth and her self-image and her confidence. And so, I mean, what's more important than that? That is also what America exactly. is about is, you know, raising children uh, um, to know that um, they have the same opportunity. And like Ms. Janine said, can do whatever they want with themselves, maybe even be president of the United States. So, uh, and then to add the cherry on top that she was the, the daughter of immigrants is just uh, makes that dessert sweeter, right? Because now yeah. I can tell her when she understands that, you know, later on, you know, she came here and her parents were from somewhere else, just like Abuela and Abuelo and, and you know, our grandparents. So, that stuff is important. It doesn't mean that, you know, mm -hmm. just because you don't have a, a, a president or a vice president that is not of color, that you won't have that. But clearly, you know, we saw a shift in in how we viewed uh, or how some people publicly felt and viewed about other people. And that's not something that America is about. Yeah, so, she's already yeah. made a difference. She's already made a difference. Now, I have mm -hmm. just two more things I wanted to cover. Uh, the time has just gone by so quickly. Doc, I know you did go back. I, I want to hear about that trip. Well, I know you've gone back several times, but tell us about the earthquake. I really would like our viewers to hear that. Sure. Um, so the earthquake occurred in 2010. Uh, absolutely devastating. So long story short, I was watching the television. I'm watching. I'm watching all of these people perish. Um, we did have. I didn't have direct family that died uh, from the earthquake, but we do have some friends of the family that passed away tragically from it. So I was watching it on the news, and I just was looking at it. I was just like, I have to be there. Like I have to help. I felt so useless just sitting there watching the television. So I just hustled and the New Yorker that I am. <laughs> and um, I mm -hmm. hustled and I, I found a way to get down there. So I, I got there uh, six weeks after the earthquake. I um, participated in a medical mission whereby they set up tents, uh, uh, a tent hospital right outside of the airport. So, um, you know, we I was just there for a week, uh, but very impactful week that I'll will never forget for the rest of my life. So of, of course, just being there, being able to help my people uh, was um, you know, something I can't even explain. The, the, the fact that I was blessed enough to get down there to have the skills, the skill set to help in that situation was, uh, was just phenomenal. Um, but I also had the chance to, um, uh, to experience, actually, uh, we actually dealt with some of the aftershocks, you know, so uh, we were, you know, and I remember some, one of the aftershocks were a bit stronger than usual. And I, you know, it was like two, three in the morning and I just heard this cry like throughout the whole city because everybody was living outside at the time. And it was just earth shattering because they were just so terrified that, that the real thing could happen again. Um, but once again, I was just really blessed uh, to be a part of helping there. And then subsequently the, um, the mission, uh, the mission folks that put this together, it was a doctor out of University of Miami. He wound up turning that into a real hospital a couple of years later. So I went several years later and volunteered in the hospital there as well to work with the sick patients. And I do go from time to time because I do have a decent amount of close uh, family there. Politically, it's been a little tough lately in the last two years. Um, uh, that's a whole other topic, but uh, there has uh, been some unrest, unfortunately. So um, pr I'm praying that we get through this difficult time because uh, I really want to go back. 
And my uncle actually has a house that he built there that I just spoke to him about today. And he's planning on putting my name in on the house. So um looking oh, forward to things. Nice. Come, yeah, I'm looking forward, you know, to all that calming down so we could get back to and that's my father's hometown where he built the house. So um wow. I love Haiti. I love Haiti. <laughs> this is so good. I have some some Haitian artwork uh original oh. in my home. I just I love the artwork. So, yeah. Mayor, have you been back to Cuba or not? Have you ever been? Have I been to so Oh, sorry. I... <laughs> they said me. Um, was that for me or Mayor? Yes. You gave to to Cuba, yes. right? You said I have never so so Cuba's a complicated um it, it's not very easy to go to Cuba and so and especially when you are uh the sons and daughters of of Cubans who have really been affected negatively by the revolution. Um, even if they have the opportunity to go back, they do not. So, you know, a lot of people, the, the only way to explain it is you know, would you, would a Jewish person ever sit at the table with a, a neo-Nazi? That that would never happen. And so you have this very, very strong uh, political, uh, emotional, historical um, thing when it comes to Cubans who have come here fleeing the revolution uh, for a better life. And so a lot, a lot of them never went back. My grandparents never went back. My grandmother, my grandmother, on my mother's side went once uh, to see her mother for the last time. But uh, so all of that to say, I have never been there. It's, it's, um, and for, and for many Cubans of my generation, it's very, very frustrating because you have like your grandparents and your parents who are like, you know, you can't go there, you can't support that government and going there, you're supporting mm -hmm. people who have killed your family. Uh, but then there is this overwhelming hunger and longing to be somewhere that you very, very much feel part of. Uh, I mm -hmm. feel very mm -hmm. Cuban, especially growing up in West New York. There's a huge population uh, after Miami, you know, Union City, West New York was the biggest Cuban population in the nation. And I believe it right. still is. Um, and so you have this overwhelming community of Cubans who miss their community. And so they made made their own communities as Cuban as they could. So you see that in Little Havana in Miami and you see it here on Bergen Line Avenue. And so you you grew up with a taste of it and knowing of it and feeling it, but I not never being there. So there's this there's right this there in the motherland for, right. for, for us. And I know that that's very much so for for many people who, who come from countries uh, that have political strife. They've never been there. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that that strengthens your desire to know more about your your culture. And so you you read mm -hmm. about it more and you and you want to you know you want to taste the foods more and learn more about the history and the and so you get to go there through the culture. Uh, the culture. But I still have a dream of going there uh, one day, mm -hmm. uh, but it's got to be under the right conditions. Uh, uh, where, uh, Trish, where I know you went back to Italy, you and your yeah. family, um, yeah, and really we had did. a ball. We did. So I was fortunate um, when we were when I was really young, up until I was about twelve or thirteen years old. My parents would take us to Italy in the summer to visit our grandparents, my aunts and uncles. You know, all of their siblings lived in Italy. They and the my grandparents were here in the US for a short period of time but they moved back, which I don't know if that's very common but all of their family moved back. So my sister and I would spend a few weeks each summer, sometimes 6 7 weeks each summer there with our family and it was important to my parents that we got to know our family and the culture and uh, the traditions, a lot of traditions, especially each small town in each section of Italy has different traditions. And then um, my mom was 75, so it was about eight years ago. She wanted a family reunion, and I brought my two daughters, who were six and eight at the time, to Italy to meet all of their, you know, second cousins and my cousins and my aunts and uncles and their great aunts and uncles. And uh, they had a blast. It was uh, it was quite a great experience. And I hope someday I'll be able to bring them back again. Um, I, right. They want to go. They remember. And they're like, oh, are we ever going to go visit our 
you know, family again. So yeah, Post I'd like to <laughs> Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> For sure. Well, you know what? We didn't get to the food, but we got to so many other things. I hope you all are going to be safe for Thanksgiving with your family stories and backgrounds. I would imagine you're accustomed to having large Thanksgiving dinners here in America, and you're not doing that this year, right? <laughs> no. No. No, we're no. Not. nobody's All doing that now. this year. Nope. Not doing that. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. And one of the things I and I know in the comments, uh, we did get Commissioner uh, Patricia Siebold. I see your comment. Gene Mulroy says very uh, insightful discussion. So he's been with us for a while, so that you know, uh, uh, Sabine. So um, one of the things that in and, and Commissioner Siebold has mentioned it that we can't uh, overlook the fact that not everyone brought to this country or not everyone in this country came here willingly. There, the Africans came, were, were brought here and enslaved. And she even mentioned the fact that uh, the native um, Americans who, are, who were here and things, um, the, the holiday that we actually celebrate is Thanksgiving, even that holiday, I look at it so differently now when you really look at the real history of what happened uh, during that period. So we've got to talk about all of that when we talk about immigration and we talk about um, the whole issue of America, why we're all here. Um, I have been enriched by this conversation tonight. I've learned more. Uh, in fact, Trish, I've learned more about you. I didn't know you were going back and forth to Italy. You know, we talk about getting our flights together and going there for a couple of weeks and we think it's great. And you were going back and forth, like um, I go back and forth up to Philadelphia. Uh, that's interesting. But um, it's been a really great show. Uh, doctor, I know you have your hands full uh, in your urgent center in New York. Um, I'm just honored that you would even take time out of your busy lifestyle to join us for this conversation. You thought it was really that important. And then certainly mayor, uh, I know you're looking at what's happening with your restaurants and all. I mean, West New York, you want some good eatings. You go there and now this is going to be impacted by this pandemic. So all I can say is please, all of you, be safe. Thank you. I'm going to have each of you back on in other venues. It's been a magnificent program. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Have a great holiday. Thank you. Thank you. So, folks, there you have it. LaRueless Cafe. That's all we got for you tonight, but it was a lot. It was some great guests. Thank you all. Good night.